welcome all of you here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Gordon Melton. I'm uh, with the Institute for Studies of Religion here at Baylor. And we are very happy to have Dr. Massimo Trevigne from Turin, Italy uh, to be visiting us for a few days. And uh, the, uh, I, I've worked with Massimo now for about 25 years or more. Uh, we've been around the world uh, doing things and Massimo has emerged as one of the leaders fighting the good fight, particularly on issues of religious freedom in various parts of the world and has developed a, a, uh, a very strong and very uh, uh, expansive message about religious persecution <coughs> and uh, today he's going to particularly uh, center in on uh, issues of Christian persecution in various parts of the world and uh, so I will turn things over to him he's going to talk and then we'll have time for a few questions thank you I'm very happy to be at Baylor is actually the third time it's not the first time but it's the first time I'm in this very fine building so I'm very happy to be here and uh, my topic is about uh, religious freedom what you see here, it's a book by Brian Grimm and Roger Finke, published in 2010, and they developed uh, some insight of um, Rodney Stark to demonstrate that uh, religious liberty is a social resource, and they propose some data to the effect that the more religious liberty there is in one country, uh, the more this country is uh, prosperous. Now in the same book, that was the, the good news. In the same book there was also bad news, and bad news is uh, only a minority of the countries in the world really enjoy religious liberty, and also Grimm and Finke attracted, called the attention to the fact that Christians uh, are uh, persecuted in uh, uh, many countries uh, of the world. Of course I want to emphasize that the topic of my lecture today is persecutions against Christians, but we as Christians are believable when we discuss these matters only if we defend the religious liberty of all the other groups and we should uh, not forget that at least in recent uh, years uh, most of those killed for their faith were Muslims killed by other Muslims, the Shia and Sunni, friends of the Islamic State, enemies of the Islamic State. So my topic today is Christians, so I will focus about Christians, but that doesn't mean that religious liberty is only a problem concerning Christians. Now I have a personal experience uh, in uh, the year 2011 from January to December I took a sabbatical from my other activities and I served as uh, the representative of the OSCE uh, for uh, combating racism, xenophobia and intolerance and discrimination against Christian and members of other religions that made for a very long business card. <laughs> but uh, the, the OIC is a sovereign organization, meaning it's not part of uh, United Nations nor of European Union. Actually, the US and Canada are members in addition to all European states and some in Asia. And the reason of the long title uh, was I had to deal, in addition to combating racism, to combating religious intolerance against all religions except the Muslim and the Jews, because there were two other departments uh, uh, combating uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. So you see the three representatives for 2011. He is a rabbi from New York. Uh, uh, was the representative for combating anti-Semitism, a senator from Uzbekistan, representative for combating uh, Islamophobia, and then me, representative for combating uh, all this other stuff. When I arrived at the OSCE, actually I had two offices in uh, Warsaw and Vienna, 
and I kept this image on my desk. Now it became uh, quite popular, you can find on the internet, uh, but it was sent to me by a missionary in Indonesia, and it's not uh, a pretty image, represents two out of three Christian girls, Theresia, 15 year old, uh, and Alfita and Yarni, 17, beheaded uh, by terrorists in Pozo, Sulawesi, Indonesia, on October 2005. And uh, basically, their only sin was they went to the, to the wrong school, and since terrorists were targeting Christian schools, they ambushed them and killed them uh, for uh, going to a Christian school in Indonesia. And the reason I kept this picture is I wanted to uh, make a statement to everybody that we are not talking only against uh, uh, some uh, uh, criticism of Christianity, but in many parts of the world Christians are actually killed for their faith. And those killed are many. This image, another uh, not pretty one, is from Nigeria. And uh, to the, according to the most reliable accounts in the last uh, 20, uh, 12 years, uh, more than 10,000 Christians have been killed by a local Islamic ultra-fundamentalist organization called Boko Haram. Now, how many Christians are killed every year uh, uh, or in history is a matter of contention. Here you see David Barrett, who was a famous, if, if but not completely uncontroversial, expert on religious statistics. But uh, uh, he published a nice book in the year 2000, calculated 75 million Christians were killed for their faith since the death of Jesus Christ to the year 2000. And out of these 70 millions, 40 millions were killed, 45 million, sorry, were killed in the 20th century. So the 20th century alone killed more Christians than all other centuries taken together. Uh, out of these 45 millions killed in the 20th century, 30 millions were killed uh, uh, by communists. This is a museum in Cambodia, what is left of a Christian village attacked by the Khmer Rouge. And uh, many young people don't know about this tragedy. We of my generation, we grew up with stories of uh, what was going on in communist countries, but many young people have no idea of the sheer numbers of Christians killed by communist regimes. Now, Barrett continued offering statistics uh, on the 21st century. They became more controversial because how you define somebody killed for his or her faith is a matter of contention. But uh, uh, without uh, entering into this discussion, let's say they are many, and uh, there are still people killed for their faith. Uh, here you see uh, Sunnit Mashiach, a Pakistani Catholic lynched in uh, 2011, uh, for having disgraced uh, his village by participating in a Marian pilgrimage. And there are many such cases throughout the world. Now, I had a very curious experience I'd like to share with you during uh, my tenure at the OSCE, because I went to speak before the uh, European Parliament, the Council of Europe, United Nations, uh, and uh, normally the audience was very sympathetic when I discussed the victims. Victims are by definition sympathetic, but the audience made out of diplomats was much less uh, comfortable when one tried to say who killed all these Christians. Uh, because normally in a detective story there is a homicide and there is a, a, a perpetrator. And here it seems there is no perpetrator or we don't want to speak about the perpetrator because perhaps uh, they have nuclear weapons, here you see North Korea, or uh, we sell uh, our products to, to them, they buy our bonds, they buy our goods, so we don't want to talk. But all these Christians are not victims of earthquake or tsunamis. Uh, if they are killed, somebody 
is killing them. And uh, today, this afternoon, I will discuss uh, four problems. The Islamic uh, ultra-fundamentalism, uh, the last salvos of uh, communism, uh, ethno-religious nationalism, and the West's own problems. So as I mentioned earlier, at the OSCE I had a colleague uh, uh, dealing with uh, combating uh, uh, Islamophobia. And we often traveled together, and I had the opportunity of discussing with him this problem at length. Of course, if we say that every uh, Muslim is a terrorism, that's typically uh, Islamophobia. But there is no Islamophobia if we say that a small uh, radical subculture within the larger Islamic fundamentalist uh, movement uh, uh, advocates and promotes terrorism and uh, killing of other Muslims, of Christians, uh, and members of other minorities. Not even all fundamentalists are terrorists. Uh, most uh, fundamentalists uh, uh, will try to seize power through democratic elections. Of course, we cannot we can not share their values, but uh, not all of them uh, go around killing people. But some do. So we should uh, recognize that not all Muslims are, funda are fundamentalists, not all fundamentalists are terrorists, but some are. So there is a problem with uh, what I prefer to call ultra-fundamentalism in order to distinguish it from uh, uh, mainline fundamentalism. So, of course, we know about the Islamic State, uh, and we know about Boko Haram in Nigeria. One of these three factions is affiliated with the Islamic State, and they do theorize uh, that uh, uh, their areas are Islamized areas, where Christians have the options of converting to Islam, uh, leave, go to exile, or die. And in Nigeria, really going to a Christian service on Sunday is a dangerous activity. Uh, you don't know whether you will be able to return home. Now, Boko Haram is a private organization, uh, and the Nigerian government is not in favor of Boko Haram. They try to eradicate it with mixed success. Uh, but in some cases, problems are created by governments, several Muslim countries have laws against apostasy, meaning it's okay to convert from another religion to Islam, but it's a crime to convert from Islam to another religion. And uh, some other countries, they do not have laws against uh, uh, apostasy, but they have laws against uh, blasphemy. And uh, some courts have the dangerous tendency of considering any criticism of Islam as blasphemy. Some of you may have heard about uh, Asia Bibi. She's a Pakistani Christian uh, woman, and uh, in 2009, uh, while washing laundry, she got into a discussion with other women, Muslim, and told them uh, that uh, 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 Jesus was a more compassionate prophet than Muhammad, especially towards uh, women. And for this she was arrested, prosecuted uh, for blasphemy, and in 2010 sentenced to death by hanging. Uh, and uh, uh, the decision was confirmed on appeal, but now is pending before the Supreme Court. And, uh, what is keeping uh, Bibi alive uh, is mostly the international pressures. And so Supreme Court in Pakistan keeps delaying the verdict because on one hand there are international pressures in favor of Asia Bibi, on the other hand there are pressures by local ultra-fundamentalists against her. Now after the Bibi case, some uh, politicians uh, uh, saw the problem as being not so much in an individual case, but in the laws against blasphemy, and say, let's get rid of the laws against uh, blasphemy. Uh, the first uh, local politician who said so was the governor of Punjab, Salman Tassir, and he was killed in a terrorist attack in January 2011. 
And on March 2011, Shabbat Bhatti, who was the uh, federal minister for religious minorities, a very pious Catholic, uh, uh, was also killed in a terrorist attack. And the Catholic Church is now considering his uh, beatification as a martyr. Nice quote, so to speak, or terrible quote, is from one uh, uh, ultra-fundamentalist uh, Somali cleric, uh, Sheikh Nur Barud. He has some authority in uh, Somalia, and in an interview he said a Muslim can never become a Christian, but he can become an apostate. Uh, such people do not have a place in Somalia. We will never recognize their existence, and we will slaughter them. And, uh, these are not uh, uh, idle words because, again, Somalia is a very dangerous country for Christians. Uh, and uh, here you see the video of the beheading of one Christian convert, uh, Galed Jama Mukhtar, in 2011, one of the first uh, uh, instances where a beheading was actually filmed and put on YouTube. So, uh, so far we dealt with uh, uh, ultra-fundamentalist uh, Muslims, uh, uh, but there are still communists around. We may believe uh, communist, uh, is a pro communism is a problem of the past, and it largely is, but for instance we have North Korea. According to both the Protestant organization Open Doors, and the Catholic organization Aid to Church in Need, North Korea is actually the most dangerous country of the world for being uh, uh, Christian. Uh, both organizations calculate that from 1948 to now, the communist regime may have killed uh, as much as 300,000 Christians, uh, or 1.3% of the whole uh, North Korean uh, uh, population. And this without uh, including uh, the discrimination in distribution of food of Christian communities, which also creates uh, problems. China. Uh, the situation in China is very complicated. They know in this university you have uh, specialists uh, such as Gordon Melton, Rodney Stark also wrote about China. So, of course, we should not uh, generalize uh, uh, at times there have been improvements in the situation of Christians in China, followed by retrenchments uh, of the regime, but still there are problems, and at least theoretically, uh, you are free to be a Christian in China, but you should belong to an organization approved by the regime. Catholics should belong to the Catholic Patriotic uh, Association, and there is an underground church of Catholics uh, who are not part of the Patriotic Association, although in these very days the Vatican is discussing with the Chinese authorities how to bring together uh, the two churches, but uh, uh, of course it's not easy. So we mentioned Islamic ultra-fundamentalism, we mentioned the uh, consequences of communism, uh, a third set of problems comes from uh, what I will call religious ethno-nationalism. Uh, for instance, India, but in particular in some states of India, uh, the Hindu nationalists uh, uh, would claim that to be a good uh, Indian you should be a Hindu. If you are not a Hindu, you are uh, some second-class citizen or even a traitor to the national cause of uh, India. And uh, particularly in the state of Orissa, but not only there, there are a number of uh, horrible crimes. Uh, here you see an evangelical Australian missionary, Graham Stewart Staines. Uh, he, he was honored by the Indian government for his charitable work with leopards. Uh, and uh, in 99, uh, he was locked in his car with two of his children, you see there, and then they burned the car and they were burned uh, uh, alive. And uh, in the same state of Orissa where this happened, uh, some Catholic priests have also been burned alive, nuns have been raped, uh, and uh, so this situation 
continuous. Of course, uh, most Buddhists are firmly opposed to violence. Uh, Buddhism is a non-violent uh, uh, religion, but uh, within the context of the civil war in uh, Sri Lanka, war mostly opposing uh, Hindu and Buddhists, uh, uh, the minorities, i.e. the Muslims and the Christians, became an easy target. And uh, some uh, Buddhist preacher even blamed the, the tsunami of 2004 to the, the wrath of the gods for the presence of uh, Christian uh, uh, missionaries. Uh, 250 churches were destroyed, and at the end of his campaign in 2008, uh, Father Karuna Ratran, who was Catholic uh, human rights activist, denouncing uh, this uh, uh, persecution of uh, Christians ended up being uh, killed. Now, much less dramatic than uh, terrorist attacks, of course, are laws uh, restricting religious uh, liberty in the name of nationalism. In uh, India, uh, nine states uh, have uh, the so-called anti-conversion laws, uh, making it uh, either a crime or very difficult to, to legally try to convert a Hindu to a different religion. And uh, in a very different context from India, of course, Russia also passed the anti-proselytization laws, uh, culminating in the uh, Yarovaya laws this July, uh, making it illegally for religious minorities to proselyte outside uh, uh, the law, uh, what the law calls specially designated space uh, or the internal perimeters of their places of worship, meaning uh, you can preach in your uh, church, but you cannot go outside. If you go outside and try uh, to, to, to uh, perform any missionary activity, uh, for a religion other than the Russian Orthodox Church, that's now actually a crime. Uh, an immediate target of uh, uh, the Russian anti-proselytization laws have been uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, because of course Jehovah's Witnesses proselyte very much outside of uh, their kingdom's hall. Uh, in 2016, uh, their premises were raided on average more than three times per month by heavily armed riot uh, police, uh, occasionally supported by protesters in the street, uh, supporting the police uh, and calling for strong action against uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, the Russian Orthodox Church is open to discuss issues of religious liberty. Here you see an image from my OSCE uh, year, uh, uh, a discussion between me and uh, the Patriarch, uh, Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church in uh, uh, Moscow. Uh, but uh, notwithstanding these openings, uh, the Yarovaya laws were passed uh, uh, in a climate uh, marked by increasing uh, uh, religious nas nationalism in Russia. Sometime uh, uh, also uh, coming together with anti-Americanism uh, because uh, local media uh, believe that uh, American uh, evangelical and other US-based groups such as the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, uh, in a way are attempted at Amer Americanizing the, the Russians and so they perceive these as attacks uh, against the traditional uh, identity of the, the Russian nation. Now, my last part uh, is that problems exist in the West. And here we should be clear, it will be a gross exaggeration to put on an equal footing uh, certain forms of discrimination of Christians in the uh, US or uh, Europe uh, uh, with the killings and tortures in some parts of Africa and Asia. So we cannot really compare. The degree of gravity is very different. Uh, but nonetheless, there are problems for religious liberty of Christians in the West too. Here you see 
a statue of the Virgin destroyed during the Occupy rally in Rome in October 2011. There are small signs, but they do uh, exist. When I was at the OSCE on uh, September 2011, I organized in Rome a conference on hate incidents and crimes against um, Christians, with 57 nations participating, uh, plus churches. Here you see Metropolitan uh, Hilarion is number two in the Moscow Patriarchate, uh, Bishop, now Cardinal Mamberti of the Vatican, and then the General Secretary at that time of the OSCE, and then uh, me at the Rome Conference. Now, at the Rome Conference, I introduced what was later called in several documents the Rome Model, and the Rome Model predicts a slippery slope from intolerance to discrimination and from discrimination to hate crimes or persecution. So there are really three stages here, intolerance, <coughs> uh, discrimination, and hate crimes. Of course, the Rome model uses uh, 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 as an example uh, intolerance and hate crimes against Christians, but it can be applied to uh, many other minorities or where a spiral of intolerance is at work. So the first stage is intolerance. Intolerance is a cultural phenomenon, and it's when groups are ridiculed through stereotype uh, or depicted as uh, uh, bad, evil, an obstacle to happiness and progress. Here is this group, and we would all be more happy if this group will not uh, uh, exist. Here you see an old cartoon, uh, uh, nativist American cartoon, uh, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism and Mormonism are two uh, crocodiles uh, uh, eating uh, uh, the uh, American uh, liberties. Now, history can be used as a tool uh, for intolerance, uh, uh, many of you here are probably familiar with this recent book by uh, Rondi Stark, uh, Bearing False Witness, uh, uh, documenting uh, how history was repeatedly used as a tool not for gaining um, scientific scholarly knowledge, but for generating uh, intolerance against um, Roman Catholicism. Popular culture can also be used to promote intolerance. Uh, uh, last month, Jack Chick died, and uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing Jack Chick years ago. And Jack Chick was a flamboyant uh, California uh, evangelical fundamentalist preacher. He produced an incredible number of anti-Catholic comics, uh, blaming Catholics for pretty much everything from the assassination of uh, Lincoln uh, to 9-11. Uh, but uh, he also attacked uh, uh, many other groups, he labeled as cults, and uh, more or less a cult was whatever group he happened to disagree with, so a very large idea of a cult. Delicate problems uh, uh, about art as an instrument of intolerance, uh, because uh, in the West, uh, uh, we are all uh, very much in favor of uh, uh, artistic freedom. Art uh, is very often provocative, uh, and we all agree it should be granted a certain margin of freedom. But, of course, there are limits. For instance, the Nazi art against the Jews was uh, something going beyond these limits. <laughs> and there are cases uh, very difficult to assess. This is Peace Christ by American photographer Andres Serrano. What Serrano did, he went to buy a crucifix uh, and he, he let him macerate in his own urine and then uh, photographed it. Now, some people say it's modern art, some people say it's just a provocation against uh, Christians, and so it's very difficult to come uh, to an agreement. Uh, here it's an even more difficult case, uh, Leon Ferrari is one of the greatest uh, contemporary Argentinian uh, artists. He died in 2013. 
and uh, he uh, specialized in depicting uh, uh, Jesus Christ uh, in strange ways. Uh, uh, the left he did during the Vietnam War to protest uh, the Vietnam War, you see Jesus Christ crucifixed on an American uh, bomber. Uh, when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, the prison Pope Cardinal Bergoglio even sued Ferrari, trying to prevent an exhibition of some of his works, uh, even if now that he's the Pope and that Ferrari's died in an interview, he has a somewhat more tolerant uh, view. Uh, I went to see the, the full floor of the museum in Buenos Aires, the, uh, a museum of modern art, dedicated to Ferrari and uh, to give you my personal impression, assuming anybody's interested in it, uh, uh, my point is Ferrari was so much obsessed with Jesus Christ that he may have been secretly fascinated by Jesus Christ. Because you don't devote your whole career to attacking Jesus Christ if you don't feel Jesus Christ is important, even if he was a Marxist. Another famous case is Charlie Hebdo. Uh, of course, uh, uh, nobody can condone or, or offer any justification for the terrorist who in 2015 killed uh, the cartoonist uh, of Charlie Hebdo. But having uh, said uh, so, the question is uh, whether some of the cartoons of Charlie Hebdo promoted themselves in tolerance against uh, Christians and Muslims. Uh, I can assure you uh, this example is very mild. Pope Francis as a prostitute, uh, uh, go, when he went to Brazil, say I'm ready to do everything to find clients. But that's uh, very mild, I mean. They even put God or Jesus Christ in very uh, questionable situations. So, uh, of course, uh, again, uh, there is no justification for those who killed the cartoonists. They are criminal. But that uh, doesn't solve the problem whether some of the cartoons uh, were in themselves uh, uh, intolerant. Here is, a, a, I think, an egregious example. Uh, this movie was very famous, Sus the Jew, uh, 1940, and the historians of cinema uh, will tell you it was technically a very well done <laughs> movie, but on the other end it was Nazi propaganda whose ultimate aim was to spread hate against the Jews. So here we have a clear example of something uh, which is part of art, uh, technically, but on the other end, uh, uh, it's aimed at promoting and generating uh, uh, intolerance. Now, uh, second uh, step or stage, uh, in the Rome model, from intolerance, we go to discrimination. And uh, uh, in a way, there is a logic, because if a group is very bad, without this group, we would all be more happy, uh, but this group exists. So we ask the state, the government, uh, please do something, and we ask for laws restricting the freedom of some religious groups. Of course, uh, the groups whose liberty is more often restricted uh, are those labeled as cults. Uh, the cults are a fruit of postmodern religious pluralism, collapse of the grand religious narratives. Many small groups emerged from the 18, 19th, 20th century, and uh, scholars call them new religious movements, but the media call them cults. Uh, and uh, most of them come directly or indirectly from Christianity. After some in incidents, very real, involving some religious groups, uh, mass suicides, uh, homicides, uh, uh, in several uh, European countries, not only European, of course you had Guyana, uh, who was not in uh, uh, Europe, uh, uh, Anti-cult movements and rallies were organized and also governments took action against the cults. Um, some measures may have been justified by the criminal actions of some so-called cults, uh, but there was also a real risk of discriminating uh, against dozens of small 
religious groups, perhaps a little bit strange, but not uh, violent nor criminal. Uh, the case of cults illustrates an important sociological uh, notion. Uh, I quote Philip Jenkins here, it was developed by uh, South African sociologist Stanley Cohen, but Philip Jenkins, who is here, uh, applied uh, it to the field uh, of uh, religion. Now, it's important, moral panic starts from real problems, not imaginary problems, <coughs> but when uh, through folk uh, statistics uh, the negative action of some uh, individuals are attributed to the whole group. Uh, a case in point is uh, pedophile priests. Of course, there are pedophile priests. That's a big tragedy for the Catholic Church, but uh, statistics uh, sometimes are grossly inflated. My favorite press cutting is uh, an American one uh, who gave, uh, like 10, 15 years ago, gave a number of pedophile priests active in the U.S. actually higher than the number of priests. So at least this one could not be true. So you see that st statistics goes inflated, and here is the problem. So of course, some cults do commit crimes. Here, as you see, the Order of the Solar Temple killed the 74 people in mass suicides and homicides in Switzerland, France, and Quebec between 94 and 97, so people are concerned, but uh, the moral panic is attributing this to all groups. There are hundreds of groups perhaps preparing mass suicide. That's not true. Some groups did mass suicide, true. Hundreds of groups, all cults uh, are likely to end up in mass suicide. That's not true. Now, cults are not the only group suffering discrimination. If we look at the uh, case law of the uh, European Court of Human Rights, uh, we find uh, a number of interesting cases. Uh, this lady is called Nadia Weida, became very famous in the UK, because what uh, did she want to do? Uh, she wanted to wear a small cross. Here she is uh, showing, see, look, it's small, it's not big. And uh, she wanted to wear a small uh, cross at the British Airways check-in counter in London, and she was fired by British Airways, say we don't allow religious symbols, they may offend clients who are not Christian. Now, the European Court of Human Rights found in her favor in 2013, in fact, the case had already been settled, but otherwise ordered British Airways to hire her back. <coughs> However, in the same day, in the Chaplin case, the court rendered another decision concerning UK, saying it's not okay to wear a cross in a hospital. And the rationale was people about to die may be scared uh, by the cross. And believe it or not, they also wrote that uh, the cross is a dangerous object which uh, may actually hurt the patients in a hospital. I don't know if it's true or not. Very contentious area is conscientious objection. Uh, this lady is uh, Lillian Ladele, uh, another British woman, uh, Christian municipal uh, registrar in uh, London, and she refused to register a same-sex uh, civil union. That was before England introduced same-sex marriage. She didn't uh, sign for a civil union and was fired. And in this case, the European Court of Human Rights uh, uh, found against her, and the appeal was not uh, admitted. While in other cases, in cases of doctors refusing to perform uh, uh, abortion, the European Court found in favor of the doctor, showing it's a very controversial area. Uh, here we are in the United States. We are probably familiar uh, with the case of uh, uh, Baronel uh, Stutzman. She is the owner of a flower business uh, who refused to do a flower composition for a same-sex marriage. And there are similar cases of uh, photographers, uh, florists, uh, bakers, uh, 
who refuse to provide services uh, for same-sex marriages. Now, these are owner and were sued, of course. Uh, these are owners of private businesses, uh, while Mrs. Ladele was a public servant. So her case was more similar to the famous one of Kim Davis in Kentucky. As you know, the Kim Davis case has been recently settled. Even more uh, controversial is when courts interfere in the internal affairs of a religion. Uh, this case, syndicatul, generated a lot of emotion. Uh, what happened is uh, uh, Orthodox priests in Romania uh, established a union. The union was not authorized by the bishops and was actually very critical of Romanian Orthodox bishops. But uh, in order to have an association made only of priests legally registered, uh, in Romania, you need the approval of the bishops. So the bishops didn't give the approval and the government uh, didn't incorporate this trade union of priests. So this priest appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, who found in their favor, generating a lot of concern. The Vatican issued an official document, for example, uh, saying we should stop at it because here we have a court uh, telling bishop what they should do in managing the internal problems of their own church. So all this opposition uh, uh, probably had an effect because uh, uh, one year after the syndicatal decision was overturned on appeal. But still, uh, from time to time, we have uh, uh, court cases uh, showing uh, uh, some judicial activism uh, in trying to intervene in the internal affairs of uh, religious denomination. Uh, according to the studies by one of our colleagues and friends, Jim Richardson, uh, uh, in at least a third of the OSCE participating uh, states, there are provisions uh, uh, that in order to operate as a religion, you need to be registered. And uh, there is a recent law, for instance, in Slovakia, it's very controversial, uh, because sometimes registration is very difficult if, and makes it difficult uh, to achieve registration if you do not have good lawyers uh, helping you in prepare all the, the paperwork. Uh, of course, the states would say we make it more difficult to register, to uh, keep in check Islamic extremism or perhaps uh, violent cults, but they end up uh, uh, discriminating uh, against legitimate churches and movements. They are just uh, small and uh, poor. Now we go to the third stage of uh, uh, intolerance. We have intolerance, cartoons, movies, uh, cultural stage. Uh, we have discrimination, legal stage, and then we have real violence, hate crimes. And there is a method in this madness uh, because uh, uh, if we have a group which is a threat to our happiness, remember, we will be more happy if this group will not exist. So we try to wipe it out with the laws. Laws don't work. And that some radicals <coughs> decide to take the law in their own hands and resort to actual violence is not uh, uh, surprising. Or sometimes the violence is institutional. It's called uh, persecution. Uh, in Italy, the fascist uh, regime uh, passed the laws uh, uh, against uh, Pentecostals. And these were parts of the Russian laws. Of course, the Russian laws uh, uh, were suggested by Nazi Germany in Italy and were mostly against the Jews. But few people know that even Pentecostals were regarded as a treat for Russian purity because they say by shaking and singing and dancing you can uh, acquire uh, uh, a bad physical uh, characters, you'll pass them to your children. So <laughs> Pentecostalism was uh, defined as a threat to Russian purity, and the number of uh, Pentecostals were arrested or beaten uh, in the street. Uh, an interesting uh, anecdote is in July 2014, Pope Francis visited the Pentecostal church of a pastor I, I know personally very well in uh, 
Caserta and apologize to the Pentecostals for the Catholic support of fascist laws and even for the cavalier use of the word cult in the fascist period by Catholics. Here you see an image of the purple triangles. Uh, these are the Jehovah's Witnesses in Nazi camp. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, to tell the truth, tried to find the modus vivendi in the beginning with the Nazi regime in Germany, but they didn't succeed. In the end, uh, 11,300 Jehovah's Witnesses were sent to concentration camps and 1,490 died there. Now, unlike the Jews uh, or the Roma, the Gypsies uh, was targeted for ethnical reasons, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses were the only group uh, allowed to return home. It was enough to tell concentration camp authorities that they were renouncing their faith and they could uh, walk uh, outside of the concentration camp. It was unique. But notwithstanding, uh, it was theoretically easy, only a handful of them accepted the, the offer, and most didn't renounce their faith and stayed in the concentration camps. Today there are hate crimes against uh, Christians. Again, we cannot compare to killings and torturing, but there is an NGO called the Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians in uh, Vienna, and every year they release a report showing uh, hundreds of cases of churches vandalized, statues destroyed or de decapitated, such as this one in Spain, etc. A case perhaps more well known in Europe than in the US is the group called the Femen, uh, a feminist movement in uh, Ukraine, uh, founded in 2008, very critical of Christianity. Uh, they attacked the Cathedral of Notre Dame in uh, Paris. Uh, they attack uh, Catholic personalities. Uh, here you see an attack on the Cardinal of Madrid. Uh, and they destroy religious symbols. They started by destroying the huge cross <laughs> erected in Kiev, uh, uh, commemorating the victim of Stalin's uh, Persecution. Of course, they get a lot of attraction uh, from uh, journalists uh, uh, because uh, they uh, do their demonstration in uh, topless. So, because they show the breasts, uh, there are always uh, a great number of journalists congregating uh, every time they demonstrate. Uh, uh, of course, they also uh, show in the breast. It's a way of scandalizing. Uh, Personalities like the Pope, uh, they uh, demonstrated in St. Peter's Square, uh, all uh, showing the breast. Uh, and uh, if you want a very Italian anecdote, I hope nobody is scandalized. Uh, in Italy, they learned it's easy to scandalize the Pope, but it's less easy to scandalize other people. We went to demonstrate against Berlusconi. And Berlusconi told them, oh, you are the feminine. Everybody has seen the breast. Will you please uh, take down also the other part? Because <laughs> that will be more original. So <laughs> Berlusconi, our famous prime minister, was not scandalized. But he said, well, the breast I have seen many times. If I can see also the, the lower part, now that will be news. But otherwise, you're wasting my time. So. <laughs> Now, many Christians, uh, and here you see some Muslims in a demonstration against the feminine, are offended by these antics. But on the other hand, there are people saying it's part of the freedom uh, uh, to demonstrate and uh, protest. So, uh, again, here we have a conflict of freedoms. So freedoms of religion on one part, and freedoms of uh, uh, expression and expressing their political protest uh, uh, on the other part. But anyway, uh, I think this model is useful to understand what's going on in the West, because the model uh, uh, stage one, intolerance, stage two, uh, discrimination, stage three, uh, persecution or hate crimes, applies to many groups. Uh, here you see 
uh, Jews in Nazi Germany. It all started with cartoons and movies. Here you see the bad Jews eating the good uh, Germans. <laughs> and when the public opinion was enough persuaded that the Jews were bad, uh, in the center you see the Nuremberg laws discriminating against the Jews. They cannot be doctors, lawyers, college professors. Uh, but uh, since uh, even with the law they didn't disappear, uh, then Auschwitz came. So the, the spiral of intolerance, intolerance, discrimination, persecution was at work. Uh, when I was at the OSC, a lot of my work, uh, because it, I was a representative for combating racism, not only religious discrimination, was with the Roma and the Sinti, uh, the gypsies. In many countries, again, the spiral, first it's intolerance. The media will say they are all thieves, responsible of many crimes. Then will be targeted by discriminatory laws, special passports, problems in obtaining documents. And in the end, they will become victims of hate crimes. Racism works in the same way. Uh, stereotypes, you see cartoons, uh, then laws, then uh, uh, hate uh, crimes. And uh, racism, uh, one may believe it's a problem of the past in civilized countries, uh, but sometimes when I see how ethnical churches uh, or religious movements from the Philippines or Korea or Africa are attacked in Europe, uh, I see a uh, two components, a component so they are cults, but there is also a racist uh, component. They are strange people from strange countries. Now, it's not uh, really my purpose today to indicate solutions uh, to uh, discrimination of Christians, uh, but uh, surely one way is interreligious dialogue, because interreligious dialogue uh, uh, may not achieve other aims, but at least uh, uh, gives a public image that uh, uh, religions are part of the solution and not uh, only part of the problems. Many people are persuaded that religions are a bad uh, uh, presence. They create wars, they create terrorism. So interreligious dialogue uh, may create the image uh, of uh, religions as part of the solution. Also remembering uh, the martyrs is a way to ecumenical and interreligious dialogue. Here you see how uh, Tiran Albania was decorated when the Pope went there. And these are all people killed by the Enver Oksha communist regime. But as you may see, some were Muslim, some were Eastern Orthodox, some were Catholic. So it's uh, uh, what the Pope called the dialogue of blood. We can commemorate together uh, martyrs killed by secular ideologies. Also, I think uh, it's important uh, in order to promote coexistence and prevent hate crimes uh, uh, to bear in mind that uh, all countries are not created equal. Uh, we cannot export the Italian model or the British model or the American models uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, for instance, in certain countries, uh, it's normal that the laws recognize that one particular church is part of the history of the country and is associated to certain public rituals, uh, be it the Church of England in uh, England or the Catholic Church in Italy or the Russian Orthodox Church in Russia. Uh, of course, that's uh, difficult to reconcile with American ideas of separation of church and state, but uh, it's not a universal idea. So when dealing with Russians, I, I happened to participate, uh, uh, even after I left the OSCE, to conferences in Russia, say we really have no quarrel with the fact that the president uh, uh, at Christmas or at Easter, he goes officially to the ceremony of the Orthodox Church. We understand this, even some of the communist leaders did this. We understand that the great majority of Russians are part of the Orthodox. We are not asking you to uphold the, the ideas of separation of church and state do not belong to your tradition. And we have no quarrel with the fact that uh, 
queens and kings in England are married and buried by the Church of England and not by the Catholic Church, even if by certain accounts there are now more Catholics than uh, uh, Church of England followers in England. We have no quarrel about this. Uh, only uh, what we can tell the Russians uh, is uh, uh, while recognizing the unique role of the Orthodox Church, you should guarantee the religious liberty to all the other religions uh, in conformity with international treaties you have signed. So uh, but that's a different uh, question. So dialogue uh, and defense of religion liberty should take into account that countries are different, but avoid two extremes, fundamentalism, where one religion discriminates against all the others, uh, and militant secularism, where a climate of anti-religious hostility uh, may lead to intolerance against all religions. I always found very prophetic uh, something Pope John Paul II uh, wrote in 1998, and it's uh, uh, the first two lines uh, uh, of his letter, Faith and Reason, because uh, he wrote this in uh, 1998, so it's three years before 9-11, and he wrote that faith and reasons are like two wings of a plane, and they should be balanced, and if they are not balanced, uh, uh, the plane will crash. And uh, uh, because uh, in fundamentalism, faith and reasons, the two wings of the plane are not balanced. Planes started crashing in, with 9-11 in more than one sense. So uh, uh, we, uh, as Christians, uh, we may believe that it's a good thing if uh, faith uh, becomes very big and reason becomes very small, but that's not the case. We have a vested interest uh, in the fact that faith and reason, uh, the Christian and the secular, are balanced. Because if they are not balanced, uh, the planes will start uh, uh, crashing. So the dialogue between faith and reason, uh, between different religions, Christians and non-Christians, believers and non-believers, uh, is the true key to defending uh, religious liberty. Thank you. Questions? Of course, if you have questions. Yes. Uh, here in the United States, we sometimes hear strange reports coming from Canada mm -hmm. about uh, discriminatory laws against public voicing against the morality of homosexuality or mm -hmm. something like that. Could could you comment on the... Yeah, the most famous case in Canada, which has international uh, ramifications, is the case of Trinity Western University, you may have heard about. Uh, 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 and it's uh, really a national problem, particularly because uh, uh, it has been solved by provincial courts in different ways. In, now, uh, Trinity Western is a Christian university, a large one, and uh, if you go to Trinity Western, you should sign a pledge uh, where you refrain from uh, having uh, sexual relationship in the dorms. And that's against uh, after incidents of rape. Uh, but uh, that's not the problem. The problem is the, the formula of the pledge where you signed that uh, you will refrain from having sexual relationship in the dorm and recognize that the university honors the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman. And that's the problem because Canada uh, has uh, also same-sex marriage. So the, the, uh, some activists saying that's discrimination because of this university honors the sanctity of a marriage between a man and a woman, but what about the marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman? That exists in Canadian law. Before U.S., they already had this. 
So uh, the protest mounted, the university refused to change the formula of the pledge, and the association of uh, 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 Canadian bars decided that law graduates from Trinity Western will not be admitted to bar, meaning they cannot work as lawyers. Mm. And uh, Trinity Western sued with very different outcome because in uh, Nova Scotia they won, but in Ontario and uh, Quebec they lost, meaning uh, you cannot be a lawyer if you are a graduate from Trinity Western in Montreal or Toronto, but you can be a lawyer in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. And in other provinces, it's still pending. So it became a case, uh, uh, the, the Canadian Catholic bishop, uh, even Trinity Western is an evangelical university, issued a document in support of Trinity Western. Uh, and that's a typical case uh, where the courts have to balance the rights of uh, homosexuals uh, uh, not to be discriminated and the rights of a Christian university to manage uh, uh, its values and its affairs as they deem fit. And the solution is not easy and the proof that the solution is not easy is in the same Canada in different provinces the courts came to different uh, conclusions about the pledge of, uh, of Trinity West. And there are similar cases in Canada. Uh, one case uh, also where the Catholic bishops took an interest, but we have similar cases in Italy, which is a Catholic, uh, more or less Catholic country, is whether the pharmacists uh, uh, have a right not to sell uh, uh, pills uh, uh, not anti-conceptional pills, but these pills causing an abortion, uh, abortive pills. And uh, again, the courts in Canada say uh, there is a law on conscientious objection for doctors against abortion, but it doesn't extend to pharmacists uh, who don't want to sell pills inducing abortions. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that many cases now are about uh, uh, life and family, and that hostility against Christians, uh, it's not because Jesus Christ is not popular. I mean, militant atheists uh, uh, existed uh, uh, from the, the, at least the 18th century, but why now? Why now they are taken seriously by the courts? Why now French courts are ordering to remove the crash at Christmas from public squares. We've been there from uh, uh, centuries. Why now? And I believe because now uh, uh, some churches uh, entered the public arena uh, for fighting issues like abortion or same-sex marriage, and they put, uh, if they are a warrior in the cultural wars, then other warriors on the cultural wars will turn uh, uh, against them. So really the reason why uh, people who claim that uh, crashes at Christmas uh, or uh, uh, Christian symbols uh, should be taken out are taken more seriously now, it's because uh, Christianity is perceived uh, as one warrior in, uh, in uh, the, 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 the cultural wars. Uh, and uh, that's why I think uh, sometimes it's dangerous for Christians uh, uh, to give uh, uh, a sort of a mandate to politicians to defend them. Because what I see in France is very dangerous on the crash case. Uh, you see the Front National of Marine Le Pen in the forefront of defending the crash. And uh, some of their leaders are not even Christian, but of course they try to ride uh, and to this wave uh, and to gain Christian uh, votes. But that's very dangerous because if the crash becomes the symbol of a political party, then perhaps the courts are right in saying it should not be in a municipality or a public school. So the way of defending the crash, saying the crash uh, uh, 
is part of the national heritage. So it's not a tool for proselytization. Uh, it's not a political statement against the immigrants. Uh, uh, it's simply there because it's part of our, we are French, we are Italians, the crash is part of our culture. To take the crash out of Naples, it will be inconceivable. What is Naples without the crash? So in Naples, nobody proposes it, but perhaps one day they will. But the way is not to make uh, the Christmas crash the symbol of a political party. We should say that it's part of the shared culture. And it is, because when we had the court case Italy versus the Council of Europe uh, at the European Court of Human Rights, they asked people to take out the crucifixes from public place, the Lauzi case. In first degree, the order was for Italy to remove the crucifixes, and then in appeal it was overturned. But the most interesting part for a sociologist was uh, Leading Institute did a survey, and in Italy, church-going Catholics are only 18% to 1-8, but 80% 8-0, supporting the position of Italy in keeping the crucifixes in public places, meaning many people who are not Catholic or active Catholic, they saw the crucifix as part of our uh, landscape. So, say, taking out the crucifix, uh, it's... Uh, uh, in a way denying our shared cultural heritage. Perhaps I'm not a Christian, but doesn't matter. The crucifix is part of what Italy uh, is all about. So that's the way to defend the presence of these symbols in public square. If they became the symbol of the Front National, it would not work. <clears throat> when I talk to, to folks who are on the other side of the issue about removing Christian symbols, et cetera, they use a historical argument that this is a, to them a symbol of, of uh, a force that uh, killed their ancestors. Uh, uh, Jews uh, say Christians killed us simply for being Jews. And uh, it's it's not a shared thing. It's it's a thing for a particular community that's not appropriate today. And how 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 do you deal with those kinds of? Mm -hmm. things? Well, I believe, uh, uh, in a way, of course, it's true, but uh, in another way, uh, we should uh, ask how far this can go, because uh, uh, many. Uh, European states have the cross on their flag, so we should change the flags. And if you walk on, uh, most of our art is representations of Christianity. Most, if you simply walk in the streets in the U.S. or uh, Italy or France, you see symbols of Christianity everywhere. So uh, if we start. Uh, 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 eliminating the Christian symbols from all public square, it, it goes very far. Uh, I always find very in found very interesting that the lady who actually started the Lao Tse case against crucifixes was a Finnish lady. Now Finland has the cross in their flag. And of course uh, the objection, but the cross is not necessarily Christian, is not valid because all these countries put the cross in the flag as a reference to Christianity, not uh, the Hindu. I know the cross in Hinduism has different meanings, but uh, those who put the cross in the Finnish flag or in the Swiss flag were not Hindus, so they really wanted to refer to Christianity. So I think we should find some compromise, uh, and uh, if we manage to create a climate uh, where Christians would acknowledge their problems with the Jews, uh, uh, and perhaps uh, Muslims would acknowledge that some Muslims kill Christians uh, in the name of Islam, uh, or, and Christians would acknowledge that some Christians didn't behave well towards uh, Muslims historically, we can create a, a, a situation where the symbols can coexist. So, the problem for me will not be to eliminate the Christian symbols, but to let them coexist uh, 
uh, with other symbols. So, for instance, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, I was never in favor of the European laws against the veil, uh, apart from when the veil can be used as disguise for uh, uh, criminal activities, but otherwise, uh, uh, the veil, what they call the veil in France, sometimes it's really a foulard. Uh, foulard, uh, uh, many women may, may use for fashion. Uh, and this summer we had this very bizarre uh, orders by some French municipalities uh, uh, against uh, uh, Muslim women uh, wearing the burkini. Now, burkini is a registered trademark of an Australian fashion designer. <coughs> and it's a uh, 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 sort of uh, costume covering the legs uh, and covering the neck and extending uh, with a sort of a hook uh, for, for women. But uh, we saw before the provisions were eliminated by the French Supreme Court, uh, we saw some very strange scene of... Uh, policemen in the beaches persuading the Muslim women to take out and to show more of their skin, which was very strange. If we remember that 20 years ago we saw the opposite scene, the policemen persuading uh, uh, some girls to cover more of their skin. Some, uh, uh, the idea was that the Muslims uh, uh, by w Muslim women, by wearing the burkini, they were making a religious assessment. Uh, and they posted the pictures uh, uh, of Jewish Orthodox women uh, uh, whose costumes are very similar, so why the Jewish Orthodox women is okay. Perhaps the French would have said that's not okay. So We didn't think about it, but now we will go after the, 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 the Jewish Orthodox women too. But uh, uh, I think uh, we should allow for the coexistence of religious symbols. And of course, all the history of all religions has glorious pages and pages of shame. So if we start uh, discussing this, we would ban the cross, uh, ban the veil, but perhaps also ban the kippah. Because somebody could say, uh, under the kippah, the Palestinians suffered. Uh, and so uh, we never stop. I think the idea is to create a climate of dialogue uh, where we do recognize that all religions behaved badly in some parts of their history, but that's not a reason not to, to coexist. So my solution, uh, if I'm asked uh, in schools uh, where there are a lot of uh, Muslim children, we have even, even have school with majority of Muslim children now in Italy or uh, it's not to say let's eliminate the Christmas tree or the crash, but let the Muslim also come with their feast and put their symbol and explain to the other children what it's all about. So the solution is inclusiveness. It's not to eliminate everything uh, for the sake of not offending uh, this or this uh, other child. extend just a little beyond specific religious liberties, but it seems to me as if one essence of religious liberty is the right of parents to pass their values on to their children. Mm -hmm. And I, I know pretty much what the situation here is in the United States, but internationally, uh, mm -hmm. how does that play out? Yeah, uh, of course there are no laws except perhaps in Albania under Henry Rocha forbidding uh, parents to talk uh, uh, about their faith with their children, but there are a lot of problems about religious schools. Uh, because uh, in some um, countries it's forbidden to religion or to minority religions to establish their own schools, which to me is part of religious liberty. And uh, in other countries, to establish religious schools is so expensive uh, uh, that it becomes uh, very difficult. Uh, we have this problem even in Italy. And uh, we have a case at the um, European Court, not the European Court of Human Rights, the European Court uh, 
uh, of the European Union, which is a very delicate case, because what happens, as you know, uh, European law is against state subsidies to companies. They should be approved by the European Union. Uh, if a bank is in trouble, uh, 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 Italy or Germany, they cannot give money to the bank. It should pass through the European Union, which now is a big problem for banks in some count, including Germany, which w used to be a watchdog uh, for not giving money to the banks, but now they have their own Deutsche Bank in uh, trouble. Now, uh, some uh, anti-secular humanist uh, filed suits against Italy, saying uh, Italy not giving money, because that's forbidden by the Constitution, but uh, allowing some tax deduction to religious schools, Catholics and Jews and Protestants, uh, they, it's like subsidizing a company. And so that's... Uh, and uh, in first degree, the European courts say yes, so Italy should stop granting uh, tax deduction to religious schools, which would cause uh, uh, most religious schools to close, because they are all struggling, is they should start paying full taxes, particularly the real estate tax. Some of them, uh, historically, they exist since 200 years, and they have large premises, so parks, uh, soccer fields. Uh, if they should start paying the real estate tax, they will, most of them they will go bankrupted. So here is a problem which looks like a purely economic uh, uh, or, or fiscal problem, but is really a problem of religious liberty. And the aim of this secular humanist through this lawsuit is not to cause the Italian government to make more money in taxes, but to shut down the religious schools. So that's the real aim of the lawsuit. So and there are similar problems in other countries. Um, if you overtax the religious schools, uh, you cause them to, to go bankrupted. And uh, this principle has been recognized, by the way, by the European Court of Human Rights, uh, in the case of Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't have school in France, uh, but uh, the European Court recognized that France created some taxes with the specific aim of uh, eliminating the Jehovah's Witnesses. They came from their anti-cult uh, mission, not from the fiscal branch of the government. So the real aim, and so these taxes were uh, cancelled by the European Court of Human Rights and Jehovah's Witnesses won a big case uh, uh, against France. So the, the problem of the parents uh, is, uh, uh, I think, uh, that uh, religions should have the right to institute their own um, schools uh, from uh, kindergarten to university. Of course, they should be watched. Uh, if they want to be accredited, they should... Uh, be inspected, uh, they should guarantee certain educational standards, uh, but also once they have a right to establish their own educational institutions, they should not be overtaxed uh, so that uh, uh, they are uh, sent to bankruptcy through heavy taxes, which is a strategy adopted in certain countries to, to say theoretically religions are free to have their own uh, schools or universities, but in practice taxes are so heavy that they cannot uh, function. Questions, uh, out of the way, and then we will call it a day. I'll say thank you, Gary. You can offer your thanks to our speaker. Uh,